Well, it's been amazing to be in this anchor series over the last few weeks as we have talked about the spiritual anchors of our house, the glory of God. Pastor Brad did such a phenomenal job talking about the glory of God and the radical grace of God last week from Pastor Ben. If you missed either of those, go back and watch them. And today we're going to be talking about the third anchor, which is extravagant worship. See, what we believe here is that the glory of God made visible and made approachable by the radical grace of God produces a response of extravagant worship in the people of God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I uh, grew up on the lake or around the lake in Gainesville, Georgia, and my parents would always tell me growing up that it's really important that friends that you surround yourself with, and I took that uh, to be true. And so I didn't really uh, so much think about the character of the friends that I surrounded myself with or what they were about. Mostly, I just was concerned with whether or not they had a boat because we didn't have a boat. And um, I found some that did have a boat. I spent a lot of time on the lake growing up and a few things that I learned from being on the lake and, and anchoring a lot of boats is this. See, here's an anchor right here. This is the only uh, anchor light enough for me to pick up. But if you anchored your real boat with this, uh, it would move. This is more like a kayak anchor here. But the important thing about anchoring is that you have to make sure the anchor gets on solid foundation. See, if you anchor in sand or in Lake Lanier, just muddy, dirty water, then as the wind blows, the boat will move with the wind, even though the anchor's down. And our theological anchor that Pastor Brad talked about is the glory of God. It is laid on a solid foundation. The rock of Jesus has no beginning, has no end, immovable glory of God. So the anchor is dropped. And then we talked about last week, this has been helping me think about it. The grace of God extending out from a glorious God through the sacrifice of his son made possible through the grace of God for us to get to the glory of God. And so if you don't get these first two anchors, then the anchor today isn't going to be that helpful for you because you can't be a worshiper of God if you haven't seen God in all of his glory and if you haven't tasted his grace personally in your own life. Hearing about the glory of God and hearing about the grace of God will not produce a worshiper. A worshiper is produced when your eyes are open and you see the glory of God and then you understand through the mercy of God, he's created a way for your life to be attached to that God. All of us in our nature are worshipers. You know that we're designed and made to be worshipers. We just worship all kinds of different things. There have been seasons in my life before I was following Jesus that I would try to anchor to anything that I thought would protect me from the storms of this world, and none of them worked. And the opportunity we have today is, look, the, the, the glory of God does not move. Whether you acknowledge it or not doesn't diminish anything about the glory of God. And the grace of God isn't dependent on you. It's an extension from a merciful God. And so we now have the opportunity for our response. You can attach your life to a lot of different things. The word worship in English comes from the combination of two words, meaning worth and ship. The things that you think are worth it, you will worship. And so what we want to do today is highlight what Paul said in Philippians compared to the surpassing worth of knowing God. I'm going to attach my life to him. So that when the wind blows, like it's blowing like never before in our nation and in our world, and it will blow boats to and fro, but I am anchored to the grace of God and to the glory of God, and my life, therefore, becomes immovable. This is the opportunity we have today as we talk about worship. So let me try to just define it real quick so I can tell you exactly what we're talking about. Worship is our response to God for who he is and for what he has done. The word extravagant isn't in my vocabulary a lot, but underneath the word extravagant in its simplest idea is that extravagant means to be without restraint. So you put those two together and what we get is an unrestrained response to who God is and to what he's done. We're going to anchor down into Romans chapter 12. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to open there, turn there, 
Uh, if you don't, maybe even go run, grab it, come back so you can look at these verses for yourself. I'm going to read it and then we're just going to walk through uh, section by section and see the implications of what it means for us to be a worshiper without restraint. First, uh, starting chapter 12, verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now to understand the power of everything that's being said here, the first word is really important. Therefore, meaning Paul is linking his future argument to all of the past things that he said in Romans. Therefore is referring to all of Romans 1-3 through 11, chapters one through 11, where we talk about the mercy of God, the grace of God, salvation through faith, the faithfulness of God, that God is a covenant keeping, promise making, promise keeping God. And then we turn to chapter 12 and he says, hey, in light of all that now, therefore, so, so there's the broad spectrum of what happens in the therefore, but there's also a narrow spectrum of what he's referring to in the therefore, which is found in the last verse of chapter 11. Let me read it for you. This is what it says in the great doxology says this in verse 36 for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. So from this one verse, I want you to understand today, wherever you're watching from today, the great two questions of life are, how did I get here and why am I here? And it's important for us to ask those questions and to seek answers for those questions. Everybody on planet Earth has those questions, whether you're following Jesus or not. And we find our answer right here in one verse. It says, for from him. So how'd you get here? From him. God Almighty thought you up, took the time to wire you up, deposit into you unique gifting, unique talent, unique skill set, and he thought that you were valuable enough to put on planet Earth. You are from God. Okay, well then why am I here? Well, you're from God, through God, and for God. God, you were created for God. The purpose of you having breath in your lungs is to give glory and worship and praise to Almighty God. That's your reason for existing. So there are lies swirling, especially around the younger generations that say your life has no meaning, your life has no value. I'm throwing the flag on that based on the authority of God's word and saying you're not an accident, you're not a mistake, you do matter. You were created by almighty God for crying out loud and you were created with an incredible purpose for your time on planet Earth. So we're going to talk through four points of what's true of worship and extravagant worship. Number one, if you're taking notes, is this. Worship is a response. Worship is a response. You go, where are you getting that from? Right here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. Now, I just want to say that urge you, brothers and sisters, is powerful because Paul understands how important worship is, how important it is to not segment our lives out and go, we'll give this part to God, but we'll keep this part for ourselves. We'll trust God with this, but not with this. And Paul's going, I'm urging you. I'm encouraging you. I'm exhorting you. I am telling you, I believe this with everything that I have. Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, isn't that amazing? So if you don't get the first two anchors, you can't get this anchor yet because this anchor is in view of the last two anchors. You have to understand the glory of God, how great he is, how powerful he is, how unchanging he is, how he has no beginning, he has no end, he's not like us, he's above us, he's different than us, he's other than us. And then you have to understand the grace of God in view of the mercy of God that made it possible for you to be reconciled to a holy God. In view of that, your response now ought to be worship. Worship is primarily about seeing, not singing. Singing is great, but if your singing isn't predicated by seeing, then you're just singing and you're not worshiping. 
because worship is a response to what we see. Now, I love being in our house because we have such a great culture of worship in this place. And anybody that comes to Passion City Church from anywhere, they'll always comment on the worship. They'll say, wow, the worship was so amazing. What, what it feels so alive in there. What are, you, what are you doing? And I love that Pastor Louis has talked about this before. It's, it's not that we have worship classes where we teach people, okay, at, in this song, at this part, this is what we do. We all put a fist in the air. We all tap our chest. We all raise our hands. No, none of that. There has been no educational process in how we worship. There's just been a revelation of Almighty God that birthed in the people of God an unrestrained worship. Worship in our house is alive because people's eyes are opened to the beauty and the grace of Almighty God. I love that Brad talked about in this first week that we need revelation and we do need revelation. In this nation, we need it maybe more than we've ever needed it. We need revelation from Almighty God. And I think that our worship is linked to our revelation. You see, I'm even guilty of this and I, I work at the church, but it's easy to come into church and sing a song that you've sung a thousand times and to sing it from memory. You ever do that in your car? You sing a song and then after it's over, you're like, I don't even know what I just sang. I just said all the words because I know all the words. And I want to challenge us. I think God wants to challenge us today. Worship is not about singing from memory. It's about singing from revelation. What I just saw has birthed a song in me. Yes, I've sung the song a million times before. But that doesn't matter. I've got revelation of almighty God. I can sing this song till Jesus comes back. This is what worship is. It is a response to what God has done and to who he is. You don't start by singing. Your singing is motivated by your seeing. So if you don't feel like worship is alive in your heart, you don't just need more worship songs. You need to get in God's word. You need to pray and ask for revelation that, that what would happen in your life is what Paul talks about in Ephesians, that the eyes of your heart would be open and you would see the glory of God and the grace of God. The natural byproduct of that will be you will be a worshiper of God. Worship is a response. And I want to gently say this because worship is not about a style. We never talk about that here. Nobody ever talks about that here. There's, there's not a correct way in which you and I should worship. But for a long time, you will see people, or even in my life, there have been seasons where I wasn't awake to extravagant worship, and I would sit in worship, and I'd kind of be like, okay, this is great. I kind of like this. I like that song. I like when this guy leads this song. And if asked about it, you would just go, oh, I'm just not that kind of a person. Like, I'm not very expressive. I just kind of more laid back. It's kind of who I am which I would say, fine, if it's that way in every other area of your life, when your team scores, when the deal comes through, if you're just also like, fine, then cool, maybe that's how you're wired. But my fear is that that has become an excuse for actually what on the inside more accurately described would be, well, I just have a casual response to a king. And we can't have a casual response to a king. If your eyes truly get what Jesus has accomplished for you and accomplished for me, you don't sit back passive as though nothing's happened. Your eyes are open, your hands are open, and you give without restraint. Worship is a response. Number two is this. Worship is more than a song. Worship is more than a song. It's fascinating right here in the text, the very next verse. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, here we go, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. To offer your body as a living sacrifice. It's not a word that's often used most of the time you hear to give your heart to God or to give your mind to God or to give your soul to God. And I believe in this text, what Paul is doing is going, we understand that there inside of our sinful humanity is the leaning, the inclination, the tendency to separate the internal and the external. 
to, to, to say, okay, yeah, if you, if you were to confront a friend who is doing something and you thought, man, you shouldn't be doing that. God's calling you to a higher standard. And you were to confront them about that. Most of the time in our culture in 2020, they would say, well, you saw what I did, but you don't know why I did it. You don't understand my heart. You don't know my motive. You don't know my intent. And Paul is going, I don't really want to have to split hairs here. I'm just going to use the word body. Every part of you, mind, yes, soul, yes, eyes, yes, and every other part too. No part is to be left hidden from worship of God. Present your bodies, all of you, everything you are. The Pharisees got this wrong. Matthew 15, Jesus himself addressing them says this, of the Pharisees, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Translation, they have severed the external from the internal. They can put on a show. They've memorized all the words, but inside their heart hasn't been transformed by the gospel power of Jesus. This is how we worship when we combine the external and the internal, the eyes, the mouth, the heart, the hands, the feet, every single fiber of our being is to be given in worship to God without restraint. This is what's true of a worshiper. Now, I want to say this because when I say worship is more than a song, what I'm not saying is that worship is not a song. Songs are amazing. We are part of an incredible house that writes music and sends music out to the world. And music has a great place in the story of God. In fact, 400 times in the scripture, there's some version of sing to God. God loves our song. Singing is extraordinarily valued. 50 of the 400 times we're being commanded by God to worship. Not you should maybe do this, but hey, I am commanding you to worship. It is incredibly powerful, incredibly essential. But my fear is if singing is our only worship, then we miss worship. Because worship isn't about singing alone. It's about singing and it's about giving and it's about the way you treat your husband and it's about the way you treat your wife and it's about the way you raise your kids and it's about how active you are in your community. Worship is total life. Nothing hidden, no chamber of my heart blocked off from God encountering me. This is what's true of worshipers. Matt Redman, who has been incredibly influential in my own life and in the worship DNA of the Passion Movement and Passion City Church, wrote this. He said in one of his songs, Heart of Worship, I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within than the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Jesus sees the exterior, but if the exterior isn't transformed with the interior, he'll say of us, like he said of the Pharisees, it's just a game. He wants to see our hearts and our outward appearance transformed as worshipers. Isaac Watts, one of the great hymn writers of all time, wrote this in When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross, maybe the best hymn of all time, in my opinion, in 1707. He says this, incredibly powerful lyrics. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Worship is more than a song. Worship is every breath in your lungs, every fiber of your being, every part of your life given to Almighty God. And then it says this, that we are to offer our bodies, what? As a living sacrifice. That word sacrifice, I, I don't think about a whole lot. It's not involved in our vocabulary a whole lot in 2020, but it's incredibly powerful. It's Old Testament language going back to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament where people would come and they would sacrifice goats and bulls and lambs to atone for their sin. So you say, well, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? I thought the sacrifices were over. Well, there's two kinds of sacrifices in the Old Testament. There's a sacrifice of atonement to cover for our sin. 
And there is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection has fulfilled one time for all time the sacrifice of atonement. So you don't have to come trembling before almighty God and figure out a way to repay him for all of your wrongdoing. It has been repaid in the person of Jesus. And when you see that, you are filled with unrestrained worship. But also there's another kind of sacrifice called the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And it very much is still in the heart of God. He desires our sacrifice of thanksgiving. The Hebrews writer writes in Hebrews chapter 13 and Pastor Louis has led us in this text so often around worship through Jesus. Therefore, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. You see, in the Old Testament, people would bring a sacrifice and they would lay it on the altar. But in order to be a sacrifice, whatever it is that was laid on the altar would have to be slain, would, would have to be killed. And so this language is kind of an oxymoron. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? That doesn't make sense. A sacrifice isn't living, a sacrifice is slain. And what's being said here is this, in the Old Testament, the worshipers of God would worship God by bringing a sacrifice and laying it on the altar. In the New Testament, in view of Jesus, who's covered our atonement, we as worshipers worship God, not by bringing a sacrifice and laying it on the altar, but by being the sacrifice and laying our life on the altar. A living, voluntary decision that says, in view of all that, you can have all of me. A living sacrifice. God's not looking for you to take something and put it on the altar. He's looking for you to take yourself and put it on the altar and say to God, you can have all of me. Number three, if you're still with me and taking notes, is this. Worship is not about you. Worship is not about you. It's right here in the text. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to who? To God. God is the object of our worship. Our worship isn't about getting a mirror in front of us and we can sing until we feel better and we receive and we get. No, our, our worship is a magnifying glass by which we can stare at heaven and even in a broken world have our perspective of Jesus blown to smithereens. This is what a magnifying glass is. You ever seen one of these? I didn't know you could still buy one of these. And I'm thankful that I was born in an era where this wasn't necessary. Uh, this is what people used to use when you read, you know, words that were really small. You have to go over it like this. Now uh, all the older statesmen among us can just change the font on their text messages to 72 and get one word on every screen. And they have no need for a magnifying glass anymore. But when you look through a magnifying glass, here's, what, here's what's powerful. See, even in our, our cultural values, we have a culture book where we talk about our cultural values as a house. And here's what it says in that, in that book. Worship is doing everything we do to the fullest potential using our unique gifts and opportunities to magnify Jesus everywhere all the time. Psalm 34, three writes this, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name forever. The word magnify to enlarge, to change our perspective of. So when you look through a magnifying glass, the object isn't the one changing. It's the person looking through the object that actually is changing. So when I look over these words and they're blown up, the words aren't actually changing at all. What is my perception of what's on the page? Jesus has never, will never change. The same yesterday, today, forever. He is great and glorious. He is a merciful God. And when we worship, nothing about that changes. What changes is our perception of him. And my fear is that we've made worship all about us. It's about the songs we like, and it's about the playlist we like, and it's about the person we like leading the song that we like. So we say, give me this. I already listened to all that album. Give me the next one. Give me a new song. Write a new song, worship leaders. Come on, I need more. I need more. I need more. And we've made all of it about us. Worship is not about us. 
Worship is this. Your biggest need was that your sin severed you from Almighty God and the mercy of God sent the Son of God down onto the people of God and, and resurrected their lives and reconciled them to God so your greatest need has been accomplished. You don't worship to get something. You worship because you've already gotten something. This is what worship is. I love that even in Matthew chapter 15, the scary verse I read earlier, it says this. These people talking of the Pharisees that outwardly praised Jesus, but inwardly their hearts were far from him. The next verse says this. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. That word vain means empty or without meaning. They're singing, but they don't even believe what they're singing. They're saying, but they're just, they're just regurgitating words. There's no revelation, no transformation, no magnifying of me in their life. And then I love that it says this, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Now, that word true and proper in the Greek is this word lohikos, which is where we get our word logical from. How amazing is that? So Paul, in light of everything that he's saying, he's going, hey, look back at the faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the kindness of God. In light of all that, our only response can be to give him our entire life. That's not a crazy thing to do. That's the logical thing to do. And we are living in a world that desperately needs logic and reason. Paul says, you want a reasonable response? You want a logical response in light of who he is? Come lay yourself down on the altar and withhold nothing from him. Lastly, and I've been so excited in the text because God uh, is a better speaker about justice than we are. And in this text, it ends, point number four is this, worship and justice are two sides of the same coin. That's in our cultural values book as well. It's been there forever. We've always talked about you can't have worship without justice. They're not separated. They're actually the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. If you're a worshiper, you will also love justice. It's the same thing. And we see it right here in this text. In fact, the word here, this is your true and proper worship. That word worship in this text is not the normal word used for worship. Underneath this word is actually two words, which means worship and service, differentiating it from all the other worships that are used. Worship here is worship in service. It's surrender to God and it's service to God. It's I humble before you and lift up praise and then I get up and I move out into the world. That's what's in this text. And then verse two says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. To not be conformed. What that means is to be conformed to the pattern of the world is to have God Almighty doing something on you on the inside and to block it off for the rest of the world. And unless it's an internal thing in your heart, everything the rest of the world can see just looks like the rest of the world. But hear me, the world doesn't need any more of what it already has. We've got plenty of those people. We need some people who what God's done on the inside flows through to the outside. What God's done in me flows through me and to the people that God's heart is after. That word transformed actually is the word metamorphosis to change as a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Something that's on the inside of me developed me and blossomed me and caused me to change into something different. And this is what a true worshiper does as worship, as this view of God and the grace of God gets into our hearts from the inside out. It begins to transform us until we are an altogether different person. God wants justice for the poor, for the oppressed. Our best worship is the song we sing as we reach out to those in need. So I want you to see right here in this text, you have 
Romans chapter 12, we're talking about worship. We're talking about Paul urging everybody, come live your life as a sacrifice. Lay your life down on the altar. And right after he says that, what does he do? He flips the coin over because worship and justice are two sides of the same coin. So you can't talk about worship and not talk about justice. It's the same thing. So Paul, in this chapter one and two, we're talking about worship. Live your life as a sacrifice. Give God everything you have. And then the rest of Romans 12, let me just read it for you. I don't have a lot of time. So I'll go quick. Verse eight, show mercy and do it cheerfully. Verse nine, love must be sincere. Verse nine again, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Again in verse 10, honor one another above yourself. 13, practice hospitality. 14, bless those who persecute you. 15, mourn with those who mourn. 16, live in harmony with one another. 16 again, associate with people of low position. 17, don't repay evil for evil. 18, don't live at peace with one another. 21, don't be, con don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. To worship God is to love mercy. To worship God is to love justice. Because when you worship God, you walk with God. You go, well, where's walking with God gonna lead me? It's gonna lead you right here to what it says in Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. To humble yourself on the altar as a sacrifice, as a living offering to God. And to pick up and to act justly, to love justice, to seek justice, to eradicate injustice, to expose it and attack it and to love mercy, to say, hey, if I'm walking with God and we're going on a walk together, he's not gonna walk by injustice. He's not gonna turn his head the other way and keep going. He's gonna park right there until injustice is eliminated. And if I'm walking with God as a worshiper who's been filled with a view of God and a heart for God, and now I'm moving with God, then my life moves with him right towards injustice. And I go, I'm gonna stay here until this is eliminated. This is what God commands of us as worshipers to act justly, to love mercy, and to humbly walk with God. If you sing songs with your mouth and you turn your head from an oppressed neighbor, you are not worshiping. Because to worship is, yes, to be filled with praise and adoration and live your life as a sacrifice to God, but then to flip the coin over and to walk with God and to move towards justice. This is who we're called to be. It's time for the worshipers to arise.